Hi, I'm Josh Gonzalez, and welcome to MindMeld. This is a podcast where I have in-depth conversations with some of the brightest people in the known universe. My aim is to spark deep conversations around interesting topics to find the tools, tactics, and philosophies that we can all use in our daily and creative lives. In this episode, I'm joined by Giovanni Beckford. Giovanni is a software engineer at Google. He's a community builder and a writer in areas around productivity, personal knowledge management, and personal development. He helps people explore ideas around combining multiple skills, tools for better thought and better thinking, engineering healthy habits, and discovering how systems in the world affect us. And I think that last part about discovering how systems in the world affect us is particularly interesting during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we talk a little bit about it, but we try to keep this conversation around, you know, the rest of these things. And I think that his description really sums up our entire conversation really well. Because we do talk about the bleeding edge of productivity and knowledge management tools and how to use these apps better. You know, tools like Evernote, Notion, Airtable, Roam Research, you name it. We talk about these and how you can kind of level up in how you use these tools. We also get really deep into personal development and we talk about some tools and habits to level up in life in general. And we do touch on entrepreneurship and no code tools and how no code is affecting entrepreneurship. And there's really a lot to unpack in this episode. So be sure to check out the show notes and the links to some of the things we talk about in this episode. I take very detailed show notes and you can find all of these on my website at joshgonzalves.com. That's J-O-S-H-G-O-N-S-A-L-V-E-S.com. The direct link is also in the description of this podcast episode. And if you found anything helpful or interesting in this episode, please share your idea or quote on Twitter and Instagram. And you can tag both me and Giovanni so we can spark a really deep conversation. And you can find both of our Twitter accounts in the description of this podcast. Just tag us and we'll be sure to respond. We're both very active on Twitter and I'm very active on Instagram as well. So let's get right into it. I'm Josh Gonzalez and this is Mind Meld with Giovanni Beckford. Giovanni, thanks so much for coming on MindMel, dude. This was awesome. I'm so glad we were able to connect through Twitter. Of all things, I think that's where I'm connecting with the coolest people right now. You're doing some really amazing stuff. So I'm really excited for this episode because I think there's going to be a lot of actionable stuff that we're going to be able to dive into here. Yeah, I completely agree. And I'm glad that we connected on Twitter. I think it's one of the best social media platforms, despite uh, the outrage wars constantly going on. I think it's what LinkedIn could have been. I think the, the, you can find the best connections through Twitter. It's like the most powerful networking and friend building tool. So I'm glad that we've been able to, to uh, plant this seed and get this conversation going. Yeah, man, I totally agree. Uh, Twitter is definitely the, the place to be right now. I find my all of my free time is going there. Anytime I have little pockets of time, it's not going on LinkedIn. It's not even Instagram. It's Twitter because that's where I'm finding like real good content. So man, this is awesome. I'm glad that we're able to connect. And I guess just so for people listening uh, to kind of understand who you are, kind of what we're going to be talking about. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you're working on, where you're working, and and then sort of like just high level your story so far, because I think that background uh, of what you've been doing really will set the tone for everything that we'll be talking about after. Sure. So I would describe my core essence as someone who wants to learn how to learn, someone who wants to help people catch up. Um, I really try to work towards helping people reflect better and connect better. So overall, I write a lot about holistic personal development, mindfulness, technology, business, uh, software. And professionally, I'm a software engineer at Google, currently based in New York. And I've built some some communities in New York. So I'm really about connecting all things, ideas, people, and software. 
So I know you're saying um, you don't want to get too deep into your work at Google, but do you want to give people a little bit of a background of sort of what you worked on there, maybe like high level what you're working on? Because Google, like there's so much going on at Google. Yeah, sure. Um, I started out working on the Google Docs team. And there I was working on optimizing the collaboration engine and to also make it more accessible for people who were uh, blind or hard of hearing. Uh, So I also worked on some algorithms to be able to announce collaborators' edits in real time. So for uh, blind users, you can't watch the cursor where it's being tracked. And the whole editor is not a normal text box. Like the the software, when when Docs was first started, um, JavaScript and the tools and technologies available weren't really uh, developed to natively do what Google Docs does. So that whole exper- editor experience is custom built from scratch um, using a lot of uh, homegrown technology that was on the frontier before uh, the web was able to catch up. And so because we diverged from some of those standards, it became difficult for uh, people who were uh, blind or, or had other disabilities to use Google Docs effectively. Uh, because the native uh, browser engine wasn't able to access the text box. So uh, I worked on making the collaboration better and more friendly for everyone to use. But yeah, currently now I work um, within the Google Maps world. So I, so I transferred. Google has a very friendly transfer program. So um, if you finish a project, do well in one place, you can always transfer teams. Um, so there's like the Android team I could have transferred to or the YouTube team. We have offices all around the world. So inward mobility is really good. Um, And it's a very uh, remote, I would say remote friendly place in terms of a tech stack. I would say Google internally has like the most powerful corporate tech stack. We have our own Google internal Google search um, for just searching everything, all our documents, all our presentations, all, all the people in the company, we have our own internal Google Maps. So in, pre-vid, in, in pre-COVID days, when we were in the office, we had like this internal app, which was basically an AR rendering of all our buildings, and we can use it to navigate our buildings. We have our own uh, internal cafeteria app. And so we're using tools to solve the problems of the company and to, in addition to the problems of the world. And so now with the work that I'm doing within Geo, there are a lot of different missions, and it's all about organizing the world's information to make it useful to find things and to find places. And so uh, I got to learn a lot about how our satellites or like our satellite contracts and how we go about taking uh, images all around the world to build the maps that you see on Google Maps and how we've used more machine learning to be able to analyze those images and to translate them into uh, 3D models that can be used on multiple devices. So Google Earth, as well as the web Google Maps and the mobile Google Maps, Um, as well as our our programs where we have cars that go around and map cities, um, and as well as the other technical advancements that we had where you can put on a a backpack, which has a a 360 degree camera. And so when people would uh, go out to map the far edges of the world, um, to map mountains, for example, you would put on this backpack and start climbing. And so that's how we were able to scan like the far edges of the earth and add that to Google map to make it more accessible. Man, that's wild. Like just the sheer, I want to say scope of that project is just ridiculous ridiculous like we're talking about literally scanning every far corner of the earth you can possibly get and then making that accessible to everyone like i personally i'm a huge fan of vr i run a vr company and google earth i'd have to say is probably my favorite vr app like it's it's mind-blowing that you can literally because of the 3d mapping technologies they're able to put that into vr now i'm in my house in toronto but i can like physically well virtually travel all the way around the world to go wherever the hell i want and it's so accurate that you can go to like literally ground floor levels. It's it's wild, man. It's crazy. So is so your work on on maps moving from docs? Did you have that choice where you're like, hey, I want to work at on maps, or was it sort of like the best fit at the time? 
Um, so I was asked by someone pretty high up uh, in, in MAPS to, to join the team, uh, partly due to my mindset. I'm a very uh, entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, I have a lot of dynamic skill sets, and I'm a very product-minded engineer. And so we're, there's a new initiative within MAPS um, to build a new app. And uh, they put together like a, a small SWAT team. And I was one of the people uh, asked to, to join this new initiative. Um, so we have our own little internal skunk works going to, to, to really create something that could be the next uh, billion user app. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that project right now. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's a great culture, great team. Um, and yeah, it's interesting now during time of COVID because a lot of our assumptions kind of got changed. We're now having to pivot and really listen to what the world needs. Um, that is more realistic to be useful for people in these difficult times right now. That's amazing. Like you think like behind the scenes, these big companies are just, you know, plowing through, they're just doing their thing, but it's really good to hear that they really are listening. Well, you have to, you have to listen to what the world really needs. I mean, you don't build a company or run a company like Google without, you know, actually you know, solving problems in the world. So it's really cool that you're able to do that. And that's a really, really good opportunity for you to work on. Because I know we talked about this before, how you have some thoughts about um, sort of your progression uh, later in life. So we can get to that. But let's go, let's go back. Let's rewind a bit. I want I want to to talk a little bit about the progression here, because you weren't always working at Google, obviously. So I want to hear a little bit about your story, um, kind of, you know, moving up to there, we talked about a sort of like black belt level of progression with some of the tools and mindset. So let's go back, let's go back to see how this all started. Because the, what the one thing that really attracted me to like reach out, and talk to you, was some of these uh, tweets that you had, I think it might have even been pinned talking about how when you're young, when you were like in college, like building out these productivity systems. And for me, I'm a huge like productivity nerd when it comes to like the tools and apps and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'll get into more of like the philosophies behind it. But like, you know, I'm always on top of that. And just seeing the way that you had connected the dots like so early on, it, it, it really resonated with me because like it totally makes sense for me now. But I'm only in my 20s now. And this is like, this is like years after even going through college. So it's cool to see that you're thinking about this early on in your career. So let's talk about let's go back there. Let's talk about those early lessons and then the progression through man, this was I think there will be a lot of really cool things going through here. Sure. Um, I would say that a lot of my mindset around tool use or stretching their capabilities starts even way back. Uh, I'm also in my 20s uh, as, as well. And uh, I would say early childhood, just the environment that I grew up. So I grew up in the Bronx in a very, uh, in, in, in basically in poverty um, and raised by a single mom who really had to be ingenuitive to be able to raise two young boys by herself um, on very little, barely me making uh, way and almost getting rejected for food stamps. And uh, when, when we got food stamps, uh, I was uh, probably 10. And so I, from a young age, I got to un unfortunately realize how difficult the world was. And I had to work really, really hard just to survive. And so a lot of my personal development or mindset around productivity is rooted in necessity. And it's rooted in constraints. And so it's, it's this thinking through life experiences of, I only have this amount of resources or this amount of time. How can I get this done? And so this, this constant hammering of like not having that much, needing to go far, and starting to really be detailed and surgical about everything that I do and all the tools that I use. And I realized from a very early age that tools or technologies are not just the software. I didn't, I wasn't able to afford a computer until I was like 16 or 17. So I went a, lo a long swath of my life without real like supercomputers or software. And so I realized that technology is more than just the, the electrical or the technical. The fire is a technology. The wheel is a technology. Our mind is a technology. And so I became a tool user across all natural objects that I can use to get the job done. And so that's, that's kind of the stage I want to set 
when it comes to how I view tools and software and technology as in they're fundamentally an extension of human will. And each technology has its own essence and purpose and pain point that it solves. And so for me, it all started with, okay, I need to get something done, but on a high level, what is my problem? Once I understood the problem and then matching it to software, I can use different combinations of tools to solve a problem. Uh, looking for one tool to solve all your problems, I realized is also another form of perfectionism because you're looking for like this genie to grant all your wishes and it's not going to exist. Uh, for tools to be effective, they should do one thing well. And so because of that, you're never going to find any perfect tool. But if you get good at one tool, you can find its core point of leverage and then use that tool to get something done. And then eventually, as you develop your skills, as you progress along this tool black belt path from the white belt, brown belt, all the in-betweens up to the black belt, you'll be able to use more tools and you'll be able to use more tools and creative combinations and you'll be able to produce simple yet complex creative output. That's insane. So first of all, I want to deconstruct this. I want to understand your mindset behind this, especially with the black belt progression. For you, what do you view as, let's start with white belt. Like what is the white belt? What's the entry point? I mean, it doesn't even have to be even software at this point. Like what to you is that white belt starting point? Yeah, to me, the white belt starting point is realizing the tool exists. So like what would be an example of that? So for example, uh, we'll start with with, uh, one of the more popular tools, not so popular today, but what started the kind of life hacker era productivity note-taking apps, uh, Evernote. Yes. So Evernote uh, and symbolism and metaphors are incredibly powerful when it comes to tools and technologies. So Evernote uses the metaphor of an elephant, and that is stacked on a metaphor of elephants remember. So elephant has, uh, elephant has long-term memory. Um, you want to take notes to build your memory. And so you get around this idea or concept of a second brain. Um, in that example, I kind of skip between multiple belts, I think, by my own definition. White belt realizes, oh, there's this tool called Evernote, which allows me to take notes. I have a problem with my remembering, so therefore I'm going to take notes. And then from that, you get into, okay, what are the features or components of of the tool? Okay, so there are folders, there are tags. I can take notes, now I can organize notes. So from there, you've progressed another degree. Okay, so I can take notes, I can organize notes, and I can label notes. How do I go about taking notes better? And so then you start thinking about frameworks around note-taking methodologies. Uh, and from there you can say, okay, I can take notes. I can uh, organize notes in a folder or tags. I can take better notes. Um, how can I take different types of notes? So you focus on text at first, but now Evernote has a feature where you can take audio notes or you can take web clippings or you can take image notes or you can save PDFs. And so now there's more complexity and more optionality and more entry points for learning. And so as you progress through that metaphor and as you progress through those use cases, uh, you develop more contexts in which to operate and you develop more superpowers in which to solve different types of problems. Yeah, it's really crazy to me. I think Evernote is one of those really good examples. I think one of the more recent ones would be more like Notion and Airtable, some of these bigger ones where it's like, they seem almost limitless. And what you're getting at is like, they're not the Swiss Army knife. Like Notion is very close. Like you could do a lot of things, but still not going to mm-hmm. do everything that you want. And it, I mean, for us, for, for the super nerds, it doesn't even have an API yet. Yeah. Come on, Notion, do it. <laughs> but, but what I love about it, especially with, um, with what your example of adding the complexity of adding all these different types of content, that's when things get a little bit crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a really good point for us to get in. It's like you're funneling information from your outside world and trying to process it, not only from your brain, but from the help of these external tools to help you further process. And of course, you know, there's different methodologies of actually taking notes, but I think at the very, like, very, very tip top of this iceberg, it's just like, 
there's so much on the internet, even there's so much that happens in the world. And how do you save that? A lot of people don't, a lot of people I know actually don't take any notes. Are you a, are you a big note taker of like saving stuff? Like I'm a designer. So like it, for me, sometimes it gets actually overwhelming. So I'm like, I love that website design. I want to save a web clipping of that. I want to save a screenshot of this. I want to save this data. I want to save this book in my book list, especially with like notion. It gets like a little bit overwhelming. Right. So how would you think about let's just call it from the point of filtering. How do you even filter what you should be taking? And then there's a second part of like the tools to actually do that. Because, you know, if, if you're trying to save a YouTube video to watch later or add in a research project, if you're going to save an article, if you're going to save, well, you know, there's so much different types of content. How do you filter that to even save it? And then how do you think about saving it and storing it in a way that you could A, remember it later and B, actually make use of it? Yeah. So first off, I, I wouldn't describe myself as a note taker. I think that's still um, more intermediate. I think there are a lot of note takers who are not taking smart notes. Um, and the focus of note taking is not really rooted in intention. Um, I'm more of a thinker who uses note taking to help the thinking process. And so that gets into the category of uh, better tools for thought. Uh, when I think about where I take the notes, um, I, I take them in, in all media forms. So I take audio notes, uh, video notes, and text notes. And those text notes have different stages. So uh, I have notepads all around me. I probably have like six notepads, one, my, one near my dresser, one at my desk, one in the living room, and then one near the kitchen. Uh, so I, I want to have uh, outlets outside of just the digital to capture my notes. So I think digital note taking is better for like more creative and complex and, and visual note taking. Um, and then I take notes on, I take notes on Evernote and I think of Evernote as a car archival oriented note taking tool. So when it comes to uh, saving PDFs, or saving scratch notes, like quick notes. If I want to write an email to someone, instead of opening up the email app and being distracted by all the oncoming email, I'll copy the question, open up Evernote, paste that question, and then write the question in Evernote. Um, if I have a long social media response, I'll also do the same in Evernote. Um, and Evernote supports a lot of integrations. So it's good for like a data warehouse uh, storing different types of notes. I use Notion. Um, as a notion is very good to visually display information and it's very hierarchical. So it's good with structured information. So it's more like a wiki or a modern day commonplace book. I use notion to store references to things. Um, I also use it in a structure that's similar to Tiago Forte's method called the power method. Yeah. Get into that. Get into that. I love that method. Yeah. Yeah. So the power method is this uh, way of, organizing your work streams in terms of projects, areas, uh, resources, or archives. Uh, projects are things that have an end date. There are groups of tasks to meet some outcome or result. Uh, areas are more indefinite or continuous or long-going things. Um, there are categories within your personal or professional life, like household things or finance or meditation or social media or your blog or family. Projects can be related to areas. And then you have resources. Resources are things that are references or any sort of information or knowledge that supports uh, projects or areas in your life. And archive are any sort of project area or resource that's no longer needed. It can be sort of put in storage or a vault. Um, and it's a way to still have this kind of archival uh, grouping where you can still go back and find it. You don't have to delete it, but it's not front of mind. It's not adding additional noise to your main areas. Totally, man. And I, that was a game changer for me. When I found out about the, the para method, that totally changed the way I think about, um, it, it's more so about structuring the, the st all the stuff. Let's just call it the stuff. So is that your primary way of, of structuring things as well? Or do you have a different way of going about it? I, I personally, uh, and this is one thing that I kind of, a little bit disappointed with myself. I'm I'm personally sitting on like five power level methodologies that I've just been hoarding to myself. And I use para 
particularly, I think it's very good. It, it works across applications. So I organize my Dropbox folder structure similar to Para. My Notion, I have uh, four primary Notion databases that are or, organized in the Projects Area Resources Archive. My Evernote is organized in Projects Area Resources Archive, um, as well as some other software. So that means when you have a project that requires multiple tools, by having that structure and hierarchy and these like workflows or swim lanes that are standardized, you know where to go and where to look across all these different tools and software. Yeah, I think that's the key. I mean, most of these apps will have like a universal search, but I would not rely on that because if you actually need to go and like find something because you can't search it in that universal search, you're screwed. Yeah. So for me, the para has been like a catch all. It doesn't matter what tool you're using. It doesn't matter, um, you know, where you're storing stuff. It works with folders. I find it works with notion. It works with Evernote. And, and for me, it just was a total game changer. Yeah. But then the other thing is like, you know, you, you mentioned that in notion, you have like five different like databases where do you break those up in like different projects or is it like you have a personal one and then you have like a projects or do you put them all into like one big thing? Yeah, all my projects go into the same database and I can use uh, tags to filter out personal or professional if I need to. Uh, but I'm a big believer in having few master databases um, as well as using some database normalization techniques, which is just mainly reducing the amount of duplication across databases and making sure that the fields or uh, properties that you have in your table are actually being used. Um, and breaking up where necessary to reference data so that your tables don't get too wide um, or, or deep. And so that's, that's a way to structure your, your database um, in an organized manner so that the data view or table is, the, is complete. It, it, it's kind of like it doesn't have um, much noise within it. Yeah, I think that's key because it, it can get totally unruly. And I think like the next layer of this too is like, you're doing this all for yourself almost, right? Like mm -hmm. high level, this is like your own personal stuff. How do you think about this now when you're collaborating? Because you, you almost need to do like a brain sync. You need to get everyone on literally the same page to like, you know, start thinking the same way you do. Like for us, I have a, a Notion wiki for my team at Controverse. So I have to like, you know, almost like, educate them on these principles and stuff. So how do you think about doing that when you start collaborating with other people, especially when th with these limitless tools that can go all over and, and it gets infinitely more complex when other people are, are contributing to it? Yeah, I, I do think there are good solo user tools and better collaborator tools. And so I, I'm mindful of that and I use different types of tools um, for collaboration. Uh, for example, say... Uh, it, with the use case of uh, Notion, even though Notion has a gallery view and whatnot, I may choose Asana or Trello over Notion if I know that there's going to be a lot of collaboration needed and that they don't need to learn the other aspects of Notion. Um, if I'm using Notion as like the central information base, then I may make that trade off and like keep the collaboration in Notion. Um, but for like one off. Uh, small short-term collaboration product projects, I'll use other tools that are more uh, collaborator friendly. And there is always, yeah, there's an education process. That's why uh, Tiago has his building a second brain course. Um, to me, it seems very intuitive uh, just because of my life's experiences and I've built the mental models and intuition around just like seeing these things. And I think even the upper levels uh, and like the black belt analogy, there's like the scale is actually uh, seven belts. So there's the white belt, blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, black belt. You would think the black belt is the highest belt, but this, it's not It's not the highest belt. There's a red and black belt, and then there's the red belt. There are certain people, I think there, it's possible for most advanced people to get to the black belt. But I think what makes it possible to break beyond that is if you can build the tool. And I think that's where my unique software engineering experience helps me. Like I'm a power user of these tools and I'm a software engineer. So I understand the inner workings. I understand how the sauce is made. And this allows me to build better mental models because all these, even with the whole um, explosion of no code tools, like no code tools are just abstractions around code. So 
all the best practices of, we're talking about notion tables and i mentioned words like database normalization like in software engineering if you're doing data modeling but if you're someone who's using a node code tool they don't teach you these things you they just give you the flexibility to do whatever but you can still do things wrong and so it helps to be able to understand more system thinking data modeling um and how to go about like structuring information so that you can get the best out of tools because i think there are some great tools but they're so flexible that people just dig themselves into a hole and then they're like oh this tool is not for me but they're just not using it in the right way yeah and they're building like these almost bad habits like for me i'm more definitely of more of the right brain creative type but i'm also um you know i did a lot of software engineering in school in university not so much now um as much as I could be or should be, I'm getting back into that now. So definitely I went from, you know, pure left brain of like programming, you know, C level, C++, going to like just pure art. And then now it's figuring out, you know, even when you're the artist or you're the project manager, you're the designer. And in your daily life, you need to have that left brain thinking, like you're saying, it's just an easy way to kind of, you know, abstract that thinking of like, like these analytical thinking. And I think you're totally right. Like for me, I didn't truly understand the databases, especially in like Airtable or Notion until I started diving into Webflow CMS, which is, it has like a database a bit. And at first it took me a while to wrap my head around it. But once I figured out that database model, which you can use in, in programming as well, that's when stuff really started to click for me when I really understood, um, you know, the CMS model of connecting data to certain attributes and stuff like that. And I think you're so right. That's when things click. So for some people who are, you know, they're on that bottom level of like white or blue belt, whatever super, what's, what's, what would you call the, the colors? The first like three, the first three are white, blue and purple. Yeah. White, blue, purple. So when you're like white, blue, purple, you know, like you said, you're just kind of using these tools. Like you can, anyone can get these apps from the app store or online and they just start using it however they think, but they don't really understand how to use it. So how, like, what would you tell people to really get a handle on something? Again, it's really hard because it's all high level and, and these are totally different types of tools, but what are some like maybe resources that you would direct them to or, or ways of thinking rather than just using it like a Google Doc, like it's just a pe- notepad, like there's more things to it, right? There's, there's t- layers deep. Is it just like go in and, and learn, go through the tutorials, go through the FAQs, or is there something beyond that that people can really start looking into? Yeah, um, I would recommend, it, it's hard to give a specific recommendation, but the category of recommendation that I would give is to look into introductory computer science courses on specific topics around database schema design, for example. So the, the, ca- the category of database schema design is that aspect of building out fields and properties and attributes and figuring out, okay, this is a problem that I have. How do I go about like creating a mini taxonomy or just like the words or definition of the data? Say that I want to create a airline site or like a, a booking system. Um, so you understand that, okay, this is what a user can do. This is what a customer can do. They can go on your website. They can pick a, a destination. Um, they can pick a departing site. They can pick a date. They can pick and some other things. And so you have those different attributes and those are different data pieces. And then you can say like, okay, uh, they'll need their first name. So that's a text. They'll need a date. They need to add their uh, departure date. So that's a date type. Um, they need to add a destination. So we need to figure out how do you want to create that because that destination could be another database in itself because they have like a city, a county or a country. And so as you go through these like introductory courses about, um, it all starts with the problem and the attributes of that, that problem or like the, the actors, you can think of it like a theater. I think a theater metaphor may, may work out where you have a stage, the stage is the table. And then you have actors and actresses, and those actors and actresses have different properties. Um, one is wearing a crown, one is wearing a dress, um, and you can say this is a, a man and this is a woman. And so you begin modeling the the, the characters, and so a, a building a database is kind of similar, and that you're figuring out how to capture the core attributes of information. I love that. I think that definitely. For me, anyways, that definitely uh, clicks because it makes total sense. Uh, You want to like what I'm hearing anyways, it's sort of like you want to break it down to its constituent parts and sort of like 
figure out what are those parts? Like, what is that part? Like, especially with all of these database tools, it's like, you know, a lot of people I've seen this because like they're used to Excel where it's just like the, um, the cells and they just keep it blank and it's just whatever. But you can give those each um, column or sorry, yeah, each column, a certain data type. Like I'm not, if you want it to be an image, make it an image type. If it's a number, don't keep it a text type, you know, turn it into a number. Like, yeah. like these tools allow you to do that. But what's cool is you're saying, because you're above that black belt, you can think of that because you're thinking of the sauce underneath it. You're thinking of the actual code behind it. And you're like, hey, it needs to be an image. So it's a totally different type of data there. So that's really, really interesting to me. And then how do you think of sort of like the next layer of that, of then connecting these tools? Like, do you just figure out, okay, like, like you said, like each tool is really good for one specific thing, then I want to connect it. Um, just because go back, to, going back to the tweet that I was talking about, where I saw you connecting all these tools, where are you with that process now? How do you think about doing it? And then again, for anyone listening, what are some of the best practices and sort of the process of building out these systems? Because it's, you know, it's not just using one tool. Like you said, it's not just using Notion for everything. It's like, there's lots of different things. Um, uh, and it just even in daily life, just to keep it very simple, it doesn't even have to be with a project, just daily life. And then maybe we can get deeper into like project specific stuff after. Yeah. So when it comes to figuring out what tools to use, I would say pick one, stick with one um, and figure out if it works. It's almost like dating. Uh, you can have the option to like date four or five people if you're lucky enough, uh, but you're spreading your time very thin. You're not able to focus. You're not able to develop depth and understanding of the other person. And so similarly with tools, like you don't want to go just like tool hooking up with every tool that comes out. You'll end up just distracting yourself. Um, so it's important to, to kind of find one tool, figure out how it works, see if it's right for you. If it works great, you have a long-term relationship with that tool. Um, and, and then from there, you, you kind of, you're born a new life. You have this new chance to start dating again, and then you can see if there's a new tool, um, and you figure out where that first tool fits into your life. And then you see where are the gaps what, what do you want to experience now in this new lifetime? And then from there, you, figure, you start with the problem. Okay, I have this tool fix this problem. These are the problems that I still have. What tools are better suited to fix this problem? Um, ideally, I think we talked about earlier of just like how it can be dangerous to try to find one tool that does everything. But it, it, you can start, your one tool can be a tool that does a lot of things good enough. Because that helps you to figure out your workflow and it allows you to start building this uh, library of concepts in your head. And then once you build that library of concepts, you can be a little bit more surgical. So for me, that was like I started using, uh, we'll, we'll go back to the Notion example again. So Notion has been a, a great tool that does many things good enough. So, but before Notion, um, I was using Google Docs all the time for my general notes. I was using uh, Airtable for my uh, database uh, and just like visual databases and other things. Um, I was using Asana sometimes for project management. Uh, I was using Google Sheets also sometimes for, for, for tables. And so it fundamentally has reduced the, the need for all those different tools. And it's allowed me to like centrally integrate things back again. Um, so with that, I can like learn the different types of how I can present data. So I would recommend people start small, start with the problem, do the thing that makes you take the action the quickest, that makes you solve the problem the quickest, and then optimize from there. You don't want to get into a, 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 a habit around pre, what they call premature optimization, um, trying to solve the problem before you do the work. Uh, doing the work is the most important thing, and then you optimize from there. I totally agree. And that's like, for me, it's like reducing the number of things you even need to be doing, the number of projects, the number of areas in your life. Like anytime you can, like reduce those areas, reduce those projects, put stuff in the back burner. I might even do like add a B in the parab, add a back burner to para and just put it, I want to go in an archive. I want to like put it in the back burner for later. But again, that's just adding too many things. Keep it to the floor, keep it simple. But what I think is really, really good is like figuring out first before all of this, 
what is the task at hand? What is the project for the podcast? Like I, I keep a notion database for each podcast um, episode. And like, there's so many different attributes I could add. I could add like, you know, I can add you as a guest and then have a whole other database as guests on MindMeld and then link out to that. But I just chose to keep it simple. Just put your name in, in the text box. Keep it very simple because my task at hand is just to remember, okay, I recorded this episode. Now I need to edit it. I've edited it. Okay, now I have to go and post it. Just I try to reduce it as much as possible. It's not adding this complexity. And then when you start connecting all these tools, it gets even crazier. And I think that is not the problem, but an issue right now in the no code space because especially when you're trying to build apps like I, like these tools are going are only getting more complex we're not talking about you know just me trying to keep a log of the books that I've read or something I, I'm trying to do something now for the public and that's what a lot of people are doing no code tools right they're building like restaurant apps and like full on platforms with with like webflow and bubble and now they're connecting all these tools, like they're using Airtable as the database connecting to Webflow. So how do you think about, you know, building these tools? Now using, I know you're saying how no code is sort of the abstraction of code, but for the people who don't necessarily get too deep in the code and these tools are sort of like, they've done 90% of the work for you. How do you think about actually melding them together now? Because you don't, it's like you can save a lot of time, at least at the beginning, the MVP stage of building out a product because you don't need to go into AWS, build out your whole uh, database and start you know, coding everything from scratch. It's like Webflow does a great job at the front end. You can connect that to your, your database. So how do you think about makers and these people who like want to build products quicker and just validate stuff? What What would you recommend for them when it comes to you know, selecting these tools and then actually building something useful and something that will actually last at least for the first, you know, little while before they start thinking about building it from scratch. Yeah, I think you mentioned a key word there uh, to start things out, and that's MVP. I think that no code tools are great um, and actually preferable as opposed to code to finding your MVP because they allow you to iterate much faster and get feedback quicker to really get to that point of product market fit, uh, figuring out that what actually solves people's problems and what people are want and or willing to pay for. So I think that's incredibly important. Um, the, the other benefit of no code tools is that, yeah, they integrate very well with each other. So you can create something very complex, seemingly on the outside, uh, but from a creator's perspective is very simple and the barrier uh, to entry is kind of lower to start. Uh, and that is also the negative. So because the barrier to entry is much lower, anyone can just kind of drag and click and create something very similar. And you're also constrained to the feature set of the no-code tools that you're providing. So if a customer asks for something and the no-code tool doesn't support that, then you can't really service your customer anymore. You can't service that new need. And then you also have this chain of dependencies Whereas if one tool in your domino goes down, it can bring down your whole system. And so uh, it, it, that also impacts performance in that because you're using these abstractions upon abstractions interchained, your performance is not going to be as fast as other products that are actually using code written and designed specifically to solving that particular problem. Um, so there's different trade-offs. And the stage of your growth will determine your strategy and your approach and how long you do. If you're trying to get your thousand true fans or if you're sub 100,000 users, uh, no code tools should be good enough for, for the most part. If it's like a simple enough uh, idea uh, where you don't have to worry about building anything from scratch. Uh, but if you want to build your like million dollar, multi million dollar business, then you most likely have to actually code that. I think you would be able to build at least a multi-million dollar business with some of these no-code tools because like, I, I'm trying to think of like sort of the categories that I've been seeing these no-code sort of like projects kind of fit in. And it seems like one of them is like, I mean, obviously people have been doing sort of these like job boards, like you see a lot of job boards, like sort of these listicles. So it's like they're using the database function of like the Airtable and they can make the Airtable database, they can turn it to the card view and then boom, publish it to the web, you know, maybe embed it on a website. So you have your own domain, but like, you know, people just want to see like a list of stuff, you know, like, you know, what are the, I don't know, what are the hotels 
in Toronto, I don't know, in New York, you can list them all, scrape them, put them into an, uh, an Airtable database, and you can put them into a database. People just want to be listed on there. Maybe you get a lot of traffic, maybe people subscribe to it. And I'm seeing like membership sites, you know, and, and co- online courses. So like these sort of things where like, I don't think if you're going to build an online course, you should go and build your own site from scratch and build, you know, the whole system, uh, the whole CMS system, the whole progression system from scratch. I'd be like, go use like teachable, you know, go, Mm -hmm. go use something that's already exists. Like something that like, it's like a catch all for that type of thing. Like I'm seeing lots of like recruitment job boards again. So it's like, why not use a tool that allows you to just white label a, a job board for that specific niche or, you know, membership sites for podcasters, whatever there's supercast, there's all these different things that are no code, but of course there's code behind it. So there's these, it's like this nether layer and I want to get into this because this is really cool. I think this is what you're really interested in too, right? It's like stuff that's like people can sign up and it builds their own branch of that app. Like Webflow is great for that where you're building full on websites in there. Or uh, I can't really think of another example right now, but it's really interesting where you're having the user sign up and then those users can then get their own users through there. So it's like this like wave effect where it's like the users of the end users are signing up. And it's really interesting to me, like that sort of like split. Yeah, yeah. I think that to, to, to your earlier point, you're seeing when you mentioned uh, the recruiting or listicle oriented stuff. Yeah, there's a category in software engineering called CRUD apps or create, read, update, delete, which is the kind of most common process or flow within apps. And those are usually table oriented uh, and have very simplistic UIs. And so it's a very easy domain or use case for no code application builders. And so you, you, you're going to see a lot of products that pop up around that category. Um, and I, yeah, they're, they're definitely not as limited in the scope because if they can get more users, they can continue to charge, but they're kind of locked to certain business models in what they can do. Um, as in like the code, the no code tools in of themselves are forms of software as a service. Yes. But you as a consumer of those tools cannot, are not creating a service for an audience. So there's a fundamental difference of like how you capture value in that chain. Totally. And so that's why I think when you see like, uh, people building products, uh, info products, or like courses or eBooks or whatnot, uh, you can make six figures, quick six figures there, maybe break a million, but the people breaking multi-million are building software as a service apps because the growth there is exponential um, because it allows more recurring revenue at a higher degree. So whereas like you put out an info product and you get like, 150k launch like breaking through whatever your expectations were and then there's kind of like this dip whereas you build a software as a service tool and it may take some time to grow you may get like 10k and then 20k and then 60k and then 120k and then 240k but the thing is if there's not that much churn that rate stabilizes and is recurring so like the math is a fundamentally different game. Like it, they, I think there's a D league that a lot of people are playing and they think they're playing on an A league, but like the A league players, the kind of multi-million dollar VC venture capital um, investments are going towards people building things that can just scale at a larger degree and are some sort of software as a service or consumer app that can be monetized at scale. But that that isn't a, a, a blocker from people still finding what would be successful for them. Um, there, there's a lot of opportunities to use these no-code tools and to create something where you don't have to work in your, for the rest of your life again or to do something that is good enough. And I don't think we have to like fixate on like these big exits. Um, you can build a one-man business, one-woman business, a small business, and do pretty well and hit the million-dollar mark or pass that million-dollar mark into tens of millions and do pretty fine. Yeah, I, man, I totally agree. I definitely want to get into that, this, the SaaS thing. So I'm, I'm sure you have ideas. I, I know where you're going with that. Um, the thing I brought up with that is like, have you read or heard of the book um, Millionaire Fastlane? 
we brought it up in the episode with James Johnny. So that, yeah, after I listened to it, I went on Goodreads to, to, to do some research on that and the other book, Unscripted. Yes. Uh, to, to, to look into getting those. I haven't read them before, but I may consider reading them. So yeah. I, would, I would highly recommend reading um, Millionaire Fastlane because... Basically, it's this idea of you could become a millionaire and like, you know, you have that retirement in sort of like two ways. Um, Mm -hmm. One way is like the millionaire slow lane. Like you're, you know, you can either get like a really, really high paying job over time and eventually get like a crazy salary, save that money up. You could also be famous or like a famous artist, like a singer. And like you make hundreds of millions, you know, being a singer. But what happens when you stop singing? (laughs) <laughs> you're not going to make any more money, you know, unless you have royalties, you're not making any money unless you're doing your thing. So his idea of the millionaire fast lane was building these systems. It was online systems, early days of the internet. So his, his um, MJ DeMarco's, if I'm getting this right, if I can remember, his millionaire fast lane idea that actually got him to his like retirement, his mini retirement was he built basically what we're talking about, these listicle sites for limousine drivers in Chicago. So all it was, which is a website that listed all of the different um, limousine driver services and people would click on it and then he would send them the lead and they would pay per lead. And because he, but he had to build this from scratch, right? There was none of this no code tool. So he was like, he had to, he had to learn coding himself because of out of necessity, as, as you talk about, it's like out of necessity, If you have this idea, you want to make it happen, you're going to have to learn how to code. You're going to have to learn how to uh, set up databases and automate all this stuff, which I think is also a really good thing to know. But what I'm thinking about now is like this new age of millionaire fast lane. You could do those types of business models that we talked about. Sure, you're you're locked into these business models, but you could create that limousine... um, app that he made in a weekend with no code tools nowadays you know you're you know you set up your air table people click on it and then it sends you an email you can forward it off to them and they pay each time so i think there's like ways now to make these millionaire fast lane apps and i think the people who are going to make the big money or you know sort of get into like you talk about this multi-million it's like you have to build multiple of these things you could do one and it'll do pretty good it could do six figures maybe seven but if you want to like really hit the big leagues you're either going to be creating the tools that other people will be using or you're going to make a handful of these different things make maybe five different niche uh, niches niches however you want to interpret that um and you're going to build out these tools because you can do it quite easily now but then the hard part is the marketing and the advertising and that's sort of where people get to um and you know we're seeing with shopify now right where like you can build an online store yeah no problem in like an hour but now your job is you're a marketer now you're you're doing you're running paid ads you're not doing you're basically a drop shipper at that point getting into it so i think it's just sort of the same thing with these no code tools, you can create like decent sized businesses that can be automated that you can keep running that you don't need to know how to code, you just have to have that core idea. And then just find the right tools that can connect the dots and make it happen. But the key is to automate it. Right. So maybe we can get a little bit into automation after that rant. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Uh, the sort of competition now has made it such that it the, the half life or sort of spike in revenue is kind of more sharp up and sharp down. And to get past that barrier, you're going to have to have like a portfolio of products. And now the competition is just so tough that to, to differentiate yourself, you have to be very specific or have like a specific special niche uh, to target. And that gets into the audience discovery product or customer development and figuring out uh, what product resonates with the audience um, or what product resonates with you and how are you the right person to build that product. And so all these different things mean that a lot of different skills are needed. So not only are a lot of different products are needed, a lot of different skills are needed and a lot of different tools are needed. Uh, Because when you're managing multiple products, then you're going to need a product management tool. You're going to need a tool to manage communications. You're going to need a tool to manage the whole design cycle uh, and development cycle. Uh, And when it comes to multiple skill sets, I went through a similar journey. So I actually started out as a designer. And then I went to business school after the financial collapse because I'm drawn to chaos. And then in in, uh, business school, I studied finance and marketing. Uh, I 
was a uh, early day uh, Bitcoin fan, uh, thanks to my friend who grew up in Venezuela and was just despised the government and introduced me to it. So that's why I loved uh, kind of finance and liberalism. Uh, I became a big fan of Ron Paul, but in parallel, I was also a marketing fan because of Apple. Um, and so that was like my business angle. When I started out design, I was focused on print design and graphic design. And then in business school, I saw technology just taking off, like just astronomical. What what year was that? If you don't, I'm, if you don't mind me asking around. Yeah, that was 2011. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, so 2011, and around that time, I actually started getting more interested in technology and decided to uh, apply to this thing called Startup School by Y Combinator. And so I applied to go to the conference, and the reason why I applied, because I read it and I was like, oh yeah, Stanford, I know Stanford, that's Stanford, Connecticut, right? Yeah, yeah. So I applied, and then I got in and then realized, wait, they want me to go to Stanford, California. <laughs> and so I, I just read it. I just read it wrong and it was just not <laughs> cultured in where things were in, in the U S. Oh no. And so I was able to get a grant by my school and they paid for my flight. They flew me out there. And the year that I went, the keynote speaker was a young Mark Zuckerberg. No uh, way. Travis Kalinowski, and uh, uh, founder of Uber. Um, like early day Uber, I think he was just like, oh yeah, we have this cool idea about when it was um, on Blackberry, uh, probably. <laughs> yeah. It was like super old. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Ron Conway and, uh, the CEO of Pinterest, it was just like an all-star lineup that year. Um, and that just like invigorated me. I was like, not only do I love technology, I love entrepreneurship and I want to do this. Uh, unfortunately my life circumstances uh, I, I mentioned earlier that I just grew up in a very difficult situation. Even going to college was an unknown for me. Like I decided it was towards the start of senior year when I was like, oh yeah, there's this college thing that people go to. Oh, too bad. I can't go to that because I don't, mm. I can't, can't afford it. And then, um, my counselor just pressured me. He's like, you're a smart kid. You should try to apply. So there's this program called HEOP or H-E-O-P, the higher educational opportunity program. And that's how I was able to, to get into to college through that program. That's amazing. Um, and so my whole life has been just like this uh, happen chance, luck, persistence, grit, ingenuity, creativity, discipline, and finding how I can use tools to connect me to opportunities. And in parallel, uh, my mom was still going through a lot of difficult situations and I didn't have much resources. So the entrepreneurial path was unfortunately too risky for me. Mm -hmm. And that was like the primary reason why I kind of went the corporate lane instead of following my heart to go to the entrepreneurial route. Um, because there was only so many risks that I could take in my life. Uh, but my first a job was in wall street. So I started working, um, in the tech and, uh, for wall street in a technical position, um, at S and P and Saturn reports to do this S&P 500, S&P ratings, and that kind of stuff. So I got immersed into finance, as well as learning about technology. Um, and then eventually, I found my way to Google a couple of years later, and I, I would have never thought. I think it, it's been a, a real... It was my dream company to get there. It was very surreal. Um, and I still have the entrepreneurial thing itching very hard. And um, I was glad to get put on this project, which is very early stage, a very entrepreneurial culture within the kind of beast of Google um, and a small team. Yeah. And uh, I'm also managing a lot of other projects outside of work. And so I run a Burning Man camp. So I've been to Burning Man four years in a row. Unfortunately, it was canceled this year due to COVID. I know. But I'm kind of glad to take a break. But um, this was going to be my first year. This would have been my oh, first wow. year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just sucks, man. Oh, well. <laughs> Maybe we'll meet up there. <laughs> yeah, right. It, uh, it's definitely the ride of a lifetime out there. Uh, so, yeah, I run a Burning Man camp. I run a personal development community called PD Nerds. I'm a facilitator for a software engineering mastermind for black software engineers called Dev Color. And I write a blog uh, on Giovanni.com where I post uh, book reviews and other uh, tools and tips about my workflow and a lot more to come. I actually think that 
the uh, I'm following uh, Naval Ravikant's saying of productize yourself. And so my site will definitely be kind of a reflection of the chaos and just like dynamicism within myself and multitudes. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that project. But amongst all these constraints that I have in my life, I've had to be very disciplined about my productivity and time management. And so tools like Notion to organize my projects, tools like Rowan Research to um, organize sporadic thoughts and to connect my thoughts, um, and then tools like Evernote to capture my written notes and emails I clip to, to Evernote uh, and newsletters, and then tools like Pocket to save uh, articles to read later and highlight, and then tools like um, rescue time to track my time online and then tools like tick tick to manage my tasks so i have like and that's just like the tip of the iceberg but i have like a tool or portfolio of tools to manage my portfolios of ambition and projects um and it allows, allows me to be very surgical with the tools that i have within the confines of constraints that i have uh to stay productive Dude, that's that's crazy. There's so much. I think that's what really draws me. I think that's where we have this really beautiful conversation because I think like like yourself, I manage a lot of different things, and you know I'm just not satisfied just doing one thing. I'm sure you could just work at Google and you that's it. But all these different things that you're doing, it's almost like it's like your soul just kind of like drives you to it. You're like I just I need I can't just do one thing. Like it's kind of weird to me that you know even like Naval saying productize yourself, it's still within that like niche saying like like. Build yourself a niche. Be known for one thing. Be known as that one person, that, that person that does this, that does X. It's like, I can't do that. And I, I think you're the same based on what I just heard. It's like, I don't want to be known for just like sort of one thing. I want to do all these things because you can start connecting the dots more easily. Because that's the only way you can really start really coming up with new novel ideas. My my mind is like, everything's been done. Basically, Almost everything, like all the basics, all been done. The only way new things are going to be formed is when those things start connecting. We start coming up with ideas from totally different sectors um, and connect them to a totally other industry because that's the way things are going to be progressing. The, the only thing, like people will think that it's completely new, but we're like, no, it's not new. We just pulled it from over there. You just didn't know about that thing over there. Yeah. <laughs> so I love that. Have you ever heard of the uh, uh, analogy slash metaphor of the hedgehog and the fox? No, I haven't. Yeah, so the hedgehog and the fox has been this old saying or fable passed on and on. It was more popularized as of late by uh, the a writer uh, Tolstoy. And it, it, it talks about these archetypes of different figures throughout history. Um, so there's the hedgehog, and the hedgehog knows one big thing. And the fox knows many little things. So the hedgehog, with its one big thing, uses that as its lens in which to view the world. Everything is viewed from that lens. So people like Einstein um, and the theory of relativity, that became his foundation for which he viewed his whole lattice work of knowledge. And then you have people like Elon Musk. Um, so Einstein's more of a hedgehog. Elon Musk is more of a fox. Um, although his little things have gotten very big now. And he really thrives himself on thinking from first principles and using associative learning to connect disciplines and the foundations across domains. And so I'm very similar to that. And I think you're a little bit similar to that as well. Roots that can go deep, um, but these branches that can go very wide against adjacent fields. But hedgehogs, the ones who know big things, they actually create, are very important to the world because they create the Lego blocks. They create these new units of knowledge. And the foxes now can take all these different lego blocks and build new foundations in the world but after a while those lego blocks run out and i think we're kind of at that edge now where we're slowing down a little bit on these new lego blocks in which to create new combinations of things oh yeah i've been feeling that hardcore too yeah absolutely yeah so peter thiel talks about that a little bit now uh, in terms of like the death of innovation and how that we've over focused on the digital world and have left the world of atoms and the physical world in ruin. And so, yeah, we're going to need a lot of people with flexible mindsets who are able to be either hedges or foxes in more nuanced contextual opportunities. Um, but usually uh, in times of order is when uh, specialization and, and hedgehogs thrive. And in times of chaos, 
um, and disorder is usually when uh, boxes thrive, because in times of chaos, you have creative dis- uh, you have creative destruction. Um, the Lego boxes are kind of thrown in the, the Lego pieces or the foundation for your castle is essentially thrown into a tornado and like all the pieces have splintered and now you have to recombine things into a new uh, configuration. And it, re- it really seems like that's where we're at right yeah, now exactly. with the, you know, right. And it's like this paradigm shift that we're in through the whole COVID. Um, well, I mean, maybe it depends where you're at in the world right now. Some people are sort of like on the out on the other side of that paradigm shift, but they're still going through it. There are some countries that are very much in the middle of that tornado. That is like, it's very uncertain, but I think because of that, the whole world is still in there. Like we're in like this really bumpy period of this paradigm shift before we finally cross over to that next side. So like, it's chaos right now. I'm sure even within Google, everyone having to rush to work from home and remote work has been accelerated for you. What is one thing that you find will be sort of that new Lego block, I guess we could say like within this due time, like what's the, or a few things, I mean, you've been in finance, you've been in uh, work and productivity. What is something that you think will be a huge opportunity right now um, during this chaotic time? Yeah, I think, uh, the kind of trend that you've been, that we we've, we've been seeing in general is that every other trailing trend has now gone through a massive time skip and has it sped up. So it's like it, we're we're basically stuck in the wormhole of March, and even though like it seems like time is moving fast and slow at the same time, and different aspects of the world and the economy in different countries are in their own separate time pockets and different things are advancing or regressing. And for us, uh, the main thing that is, or in general across the board, what, what is accelerating is this digitization and, and shift to uh, digital co- commerce, specifically dif- digital communication, um, more uh, independent workers, uh, more people who are trying to decouple themselves from the government, from jobs, from a particular location. And so we have uh, an environment where there's going to be, le- there's going to be more islands in the world as in like cut off islands as countries start to domesticate themselves better and deglobalize themselves to reduce their sort of risk to, um, to China. Uh, and so we're going to have faster domestic velocity. So there's going to be most likely a lot more factories that come up within the US uh, when we realize that all our core essentials to, to create vaccines, to create masks, uh, to create the ventilators and supplies we need were all being made in China. And, and they weren't able, and we, it started a bidding war between states, it started a bidding war amongst nations. Uh, that became a significant security risk. So I think that the one big opportunity we're going to see is a move to domestic homemade manufacturing. I think that there are going to be big investments in infrastructure. Um, Unfortunately, we're in a period that's looking like it's potentially going to be worse than the Great Depression. Really? You believe that too, right? Yeah? Yeah. I, I don't think shit has really hit the fan yet. I think we're uh, on a four. We're on a four out of ten on the shit hit the fan scale. I, I don't think really. Like how long do you think? I mean, obviously, no one can really know, but like, how long, like, time period wise, roughly, do you think it will start to really ramp up? I think it will happen within the year. Um, I think that within the end of this year. I think most likely within the year. I think there are a couple dynamics that we're not taking into account. So the difference between the Great Depression and now is debt. So when you think about the gold standard and how we moved off of that post-depression, um, so they weren't going through like mass inflation and price inflation. When you think about how there was much fewer people, uh, people were more collectivist as opposed to individualist. Uh, families were kept intact. So you can just like, it would be like, a family that's suffering together as opposed to an environment now where people are kind of su- suffered all across the place. We're all fractured. Commu- our sense of community is very dissolved. Our sense of tribe is very devo- dissolved. 
religion has been basically decimated over yeah, yeah. religion is decimated yeah. so faith so our, our ability to deal with suffering and to find meaning is very difficult right now mm-hmm. um the amount of consumer debt so the consumer debt is through the roof uh student loan debt through the roof and you have gross gdp a gross domestic product shrinking potentially 30 percent. that's never happened in the history before uh and you have uh, impending so 2008 collapse was uh residential real estate was shaky from people who couldn't pay loans so there were the, the subprime loan crisis now you have potentially over 30 million people who could be evicted within the next two months and you have all the largest institutions thinking about uh permanent work from home so you have like this impending avalanche of like mass commercial real estate implosion that's crazy um so that's never like that's not we don't have the data to figure like we just don't know we're going through a lot 2020 is so new like even though history repeats itself in rhymes there's so much new things that we just have not dealt with yeah i mean even take like this for example like no one had portals in their house where they can talk to people and meet with new people which i am also like i'm an optimist too i tend to you know i a lot of people I was talking to, they're like, you know, when everything first hit the fan in March, people are like, yeah, take all your money out of the stock market. Don't do that. And as soon as it hit the bottom, people are like, yeah, it's going to keep going. There's going to bounce up and just go down. I'm like, yeah, but like you can make a fuck ton of money by just putting in a, quite a bit of money right now in the right places. And within a short period of time, get in, get out. Do you think that still, I mean, we've seen a bounce back, even the S&P. Um, do you think that that's going to go right back down? Do you think there's going to be a huge implosion and we're going to see a mass, another massive um, downfall? The, the biggest lesson I've learned through this experience is to understand the stock market is not real life. Right. It's the stock market is its own game with its own rules. And you cannot use the economy to determine what it's, how it's going to move or what it's going to play. And there are so many different incentives within the stakeholders of the major institutions retail investors are a very small fraction of actual trading volume yeah but together i've been thinking about it it's like what about those like you know the robin hood traders <laughs> i'm sure you've been seeing that yeah yeah there's they're a very small portion of trading volume actually very very small so they're not moving the the, the needle but i agree with your statement of being a, i'm actually a very i would just categorize myself as a rational optimist as something's on fire I will say that, why is that thing on fire? Like, does anyone want to see this thing is on fire? And then after a while, I'll be like, oh, wait, we're kind of in the winter. We kind of needed heat. So this is kind of good. So I think that we're going through, we're going to go through so much civilizational progress through this time skip that we're experiencing of this mass digitization, this mass correcting that we're going. There were so many broken parts of the system that are now being, it's like a snake is shedding its skin the old tree, tree is like shedding its leaves and growing and growing new leaves. We're going through this forest fire. A lot of people are feeling immense pain right now. Um, there's a lot of people feeling hopeless. And I do think that there's going to be an impending mental health crisis. Um, there, there's just so many things that are troubling going on. I would say the, the bright side that I can try hard to see is that a lot of the things that have not been working for hundreds of years will probably be fixed in the next five to 10 years. What, what are those things that you think? Like, what are some key things? The incentive structure of the media will definitely be, I think, will be addressed. I think that the educational system is going to go through a massive revamping. I think the medical system is going to go through a mass revamping. I think that the efficiency for the government to allocate checks or experimenting with things like universal basic income is going to be a necessity. I think that our cultural practice around sanitation and cleanliness will increase. I think our knowledge and learning for how to deal with pandemic or contagions will be fine-tuned. We'll we'll learn from the experience. I think we lucked out that even despite this being highly contagious, this is very low mortality rate. If we had to deal with something like Ebola, at scale or uh the spanish flu at scale or influenza black death all those things at scale Mm -hmm. it would completely dust like when that when the black death occurred legitimately one third of the human population in europe disappeared like died that's crazy and that was without 
wide scale boats and airplanes. Jeez. If that were to happen today, I, I don't know what would have, would have happened. We're just so connected. We're seven, over 7 billion people. The world population back then was like 1.2 billion or something like that. So I, I'm, I think there's a lot to be grateful for. Um, I'm very optimistic that uh, people are going to wake up and realize that they need to take responsibility. I think things will become much more local. Um, I think community will revitalize as well. Yeah. What do you think about the, the, the spiritual awakening? Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. I think that I think there will be a net positive for spiritual awakening. What I mean by that is just uh, so many distractions have been re- removed. Um, we went through that huge swath of time of not having any sports, not having the movie theaters. Um, Hollywood production slowed down significantly. Uh, people, unfortunately, who had lost their jobs or were furloughed, uh, that that was a difficult. Uh, that's a traumatic event to be going through, and at the same time. Certain people may have been in jobs that they hated and despised and never had the time to like think and reflect or like see what they value. Some people are able to work from home now and spend time with their, their loved ones and their kids um, and find out what's really important to them. Uh, some people are able to sit by themselves. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who are socially isolated. And at the same time, it's an opportunity to learn how to be still and to find companionship within yourself. Um, so I think everything has just like, sped up in certain ways but slowed down at the individual level and that is a a really rare opportunity to happen at this global scale this is i don't think this has happened before in the last hundred years no it's, it's a huge opportunity i think like even for me like i said i was doing a lot of vr stuff before this but it was for public use so like you, you would think vr would be a net positive like our industry is great everyone's gonna go into vr but no one has headsets and it doesn't really seem like everyone's that all that interested in vr so it gave me time to kind of think reflect and start doing different things to help me uh, take the time to build this podcast, which then brings us together and have this amazing conversation and share with other people. So I think there's so many amazing things that have happened in the last couple months. And I think you're right. I think shit hasn't really gotten to the 10. Shit will continue to to kind of hit the fan, as as so to say. So you know, I hope people can ha- uh, hang in there and, and do what they need to do. But I do believe it's a great time to rebuild yourself. And I know you're all into personal development. So that's what I've been doing the last couple of months. That's what I'll continue to do. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm sure you're the same. Um, I got super into like Mind Valley. I'm not sure if you heard of that company, but it's huge. That was a big thing for me. Um, it's been an amazing time though. But um, the one thing that I have to say that definitely helped me again was keeping on a daily schedule, daily rituals, daily routines, um, and it manage it through Notion. Like I have a daily journal that I write, write through in Notion. So I built that system for me to reflect, to write, to plan the day. Is there anything like that that you do? Do you do like daily reflections, daily journaling like that to to kind of go back and, and, and learn and also just reflect on the day? Yeah. Uh, I Pretty much the theme of my life is that I have a system for everything, like legitimately almost everything, uh, including a journaling. I started my journaling practice a little bit more than a decade ago and it was out of necessity in that i grew up incredibly socially isolated and introverted and when i started uh, going to high school and just like being in more social environments i had to deal with social anxiety i had to deal with just learning interpersonal skills and i had a lot of racing thoughts in my head and i needed an outlet to um, put those thoughts to just have an exhaust valve almost and so writing was a way for me to uh, stabilize myself first emotionally, and then later on became the practice of like thinking better. Um, I, on the emotional aspect, I developed a, a, a writing practice called the Empathy Journal. And the Empathy Journal was where instead of writing about myself, I would only write about other people's story and their experience. And so it trained me how to be a better listener and to learn how to tell people's story. And it allowed me to get out of myself and be more in service of others. Um, later on, I realized the power of that pattern because when I started writing about myself again, and I used a tool called 750words.com, which is based off the, um, the uh, practice around morning pages um, and a book called The Artist's Way. Uh, so that site had a feature where you can... Um, it gamified writing 750 words, which is about three pages handwritten, and it had sentiment analysis, so it can tell you 
uh, what you're writing about. So it can tell you if you're writing about family or friends. It can tell you if your writing sounds happy or sad. Um, and it also pick out some thematic elements and create a word cloud. And over a course of three or six months, I realized that I was writing about I and me and my a lot. And I really wanted to rebalance my perspective towards you um, and other people or we and us. So the, I brought back the empathy journal to cultivate that practice around like service oriented mindfulness. And I also do mood tracking now. So I use an app called Dalio and I've been using that tool for almost three years now. Um, it has a daily prompt. How are you feeling? And then once you pick a mood, it asks you, what are you doing? And so it has this library of activities that you can select. And then you can write two or three sentences to kind of summarize uh, the day in that mood. And then after a while, it creates a report and tells you your mood over time and the activities that align with the moods that you want to feel more of. Um, so that's the element of micro journaling that I've been incorporating more. And at the end of the year, I do an annual review process. So this was kind of inspired from like the professional world where you have like a performance review, but in a personal sense, it is a review of my life areas and an audit of the year um, and a moment for me to really kind of close the chapter for the year. And I think about what went well, what didn't go well, what am I working on improving, what am I reducing, and what am I working towards. And I do this assessment throughout my life. I go through my, my journal entries, any other mood notes, any other photos. I go through my, all my Google photos and sort of pick like two photos per month. And I kind of like summarize the themes and I create this mini catalog and like report that sometimes ends up being like 3000 plus words. And in the beginning, I used to just share it with close friends. And then I wanted to work on building my vulnerability. So um, then after that, I shared it on Facebook. And then the other year, I wanted to share it again. So I started posting it on my blog, but it was still kind of within the bubble. And then after that, I was like, okay, I'm going to post it on Twitter. And then after that, I was like, okay, I'm going to share it on LinkedIn. And I remember one time I went to work and a coworker said like, oh, hey, Jermaine, I just read your annual review. And I was like, oh, what? And that <laughs> one I talked about when I got ghosted like three times that year or when I broke up with such and such or when I went through depression. And, and so it's very deep. It's like you're reading my journals. And for me, it's a way for me to really take ownership over the fear and to use it like a weapon and to also share it with others to tell them that they're not alone. Especially when I went through depression in 2016, I thought that wasn't something that I could ever go through. It just hit me out of nowhere. I was this ultra type A Actually, not even a type A because my type A friends didn't have a letter for me. Um, I was just this go, go, go person. And when depression hit me, I was like, whoa, what the hell is going on here? And I realized that just certain aspects of myself started to disappear. I started to forget what it felt like to be happy. I would literally go on YouTube and search compilations or 10 hour loops of sad piano music. Um, I would go on Netflix and just like binge the most depressing stuff. I would like search the most depressing anime. Um, for those familiar with anime, I, uh, that was the same year that I binged the manga Berserk. Um, for those who know, you will understand that's not the type of manga, manga you want to binge. Uh, and yeah, throughout the whole experience, because I had a journaling practice and I had some sense of myself that I can orient myself to become an observed observer, to start observing my experience, I started journaling through that experience as well. Eventually, I made my way through out of that experience. That was also the same year that I went to, to Burning Man. While I was going to, that was my first year to go in Burning Man, uh, recommended by my friend Chris. And one of the moments that helped to just slightly wake me up was when I was supposed to get all my packages delivered. It was T minus two weeks to go to Burning Man out in Nevada desert. For, for a week and a half. And I got this delivery notification saying that, okay, and these are like my core essentials. And there was like, everything else was sold out. So if I didn't get these, then I was like, didn't have any supplies pretty much. And I got this delivery notification, open up my door and I didn't see the packages. So I'm like, what the hell? A couple of days go by and I message them and I'm like, I didn't get my packages and they can't send it in time because they're out of inventory. 
and the Burning Man at this point is a one week away. And a couple of days after that, someone knocks on my door. He was like, hey, uh, I think they delivered these to the wrong address. I wanted to bring these over to you. And this guy brings me my packages. And in that moment, I was like, oh, and I was like, oh, there it is. Joy, happy. Oh, remember this. Remember this feeling. And I started like just realizing that happiness can come to you out of anywhere. You may forget it, but there will be a moment where even though you're in the chaos of the storm and there's dark clouds, you're going to hit that point where the sunshine breaks through and you're going to feel this warmth and you're going to feel this light. Remember it. You're going to remember how to navigate the turret, how to navigate uh, the storm. And for me, that experience, that was a small experience that gave me a major insight to realizing that just life is this crazy roller coaster that never ends and you need to enjoy the ride no matter if you're on the top or if you're on the bottom. Um, it's the ride that counts. And it, there's, there's always meaning that you can find in the world and there's always a reason to live. Um, so that's, that's my kind of mini story when you asked about it in my journal, but hope that sheds some light. I love that. Dude, that's going to help so many people. That's going to help me. I'm keeping that. I'm keeping that sound clip. That's, dude, that's incredible. Like, that's, that's why I do this. Share your story because you never know, man. Like, that's going to hit someone so deep. That resonated with me so fucking hard, dude. Oh, because I'm first, I'm thinking, I'm like, you know, also like, why, what is the point of journaling? What is the point of capturing all this? It's so you can look back and remember. That's literally what it is, dude. It's, the more you can document, the more that you can document those like great parts in life, you're going to look back on these moments, like you said, these dark moments and just remember what it was like and be like, oh yeah, I, I kind of remember that little bit of sunlight will start creeping through. So dude, thank you so much for sharing that story. That was incredible. That's, that's so cool. And of course it's Burning Man. That's, that, that's like yeah. the spark that starts bringing you back up, which is cool. Yeah. And there's one other aspect of journaling too, at least if you're, cause there are, there are definitely certain people that reflect on the journal and those that never look back on the journal for them. It's kind of this ethereal process to just get it out. Uh, either method, whatever works for you is good. One, one thing that I like about, at least within the scope of my annual review, uh, this year I'm actually going to do a decade in review that reviews the 2010s, which is going to be the wow. grand compilation. So from that, do you go back and look in all your notes and look at all your journals? Is that what you'll do? Yeah. And how long is that process? Well, I mean, obviously you haven't done it yet, but I mean, for your annual review, how long does that process take? Yeah. For the annual review, it takes me about two months. Okay. To finish that. Yeah. So like two hours a day or two hours, like on the weekends or some of theirs is very emotionally intensive exercise. So I totally kind of like some deep work focus on that. But when it comes to review, like the looking back, what I learned is that I gained a lot of compassion for myself. I gained a lot of self love um, through just realizing the different stages and milestones that I have. Mm -hmm. And I also gained a very strong past and future orientation. And I think the future orientation is what helps to build discipline because you realize that the past and future you is different yet the same. They're all connected in the same timeline. Even though the future doesn't exist, the present is the only thing that exists. Um, but you can leave yourself a gift for the future. Uh, I, I like to do that all the time. I make a little game. I try to like just make things easier for my future self, a little gift. And then when that time comes in the present, in the future, I kind of stumble upon it. And I'm just like, I smirk to myself and I'm like, you bastard. How do you know I need this? It's like planting fruits and you plant the tree when you know you need the shade when the summer comes around. Yes. Yes, man. And that's what investing is, whether it's money or into yourself. And that's why like it clearly you're into personal development for that reason. I think of it the exact same way. It's like you're giving yourself a gift for the future. I, man, I think about that all the time. It could be something as simple as like, Hey, go put your workout clothes, you know, near the door. So it's easier in the morning. Cause you know, also habit wise, you're like, I'm going to get up like, Oh, my clothes are ready for me already. Oh, who did that? And then obviously the ne the next level of that is when you're with your partner, like, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband. And then you realize that when you start doing stuff for them and you start doing these you know, little tiny things, it doesn't have to be big, something very small, that actually comes right back to you because you're building each other up. That When you start building them up, they pull you up and they pull you up and it keeps going. But you can also do that with yourself, which is totally what self-development is all about. Because at the end of the day, yeah, you can be in a loving relationship, but at the end of the day, 
you only have yourself, you know, when you're in the grave or even before that, you're just, or on a shitty rainy day walking outside, you're by yourself. So it's self-love. you better watch what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's exactly. It's self-love, man. So I really want to ask you then, you know, especially through the self-development stuff, not a lot of people are really into it. And part of my job is sort of like awakening people to this because a lot of people are in, you know, they're stuck in the quote unquote matrix and they're just doing the day to day. They're not mm-hmm, thinking mm-hmm. about it. They're, they're not, they're really thinking about their past selves, let alone their future selves, let alone any of this stuff. So I want to ask you, man, like, did you have like an awakening moment? Did you have an aha moment? Something that, you know, the whole unplug from the matrix moment. Did you have it? Did you have that? Do you have a story behind that? Yeah. To, to give some context about that comment about it, it, there's not that many people that focus on it. I run a personal development group, PD Nerds. Uh, we have a Facebook group, Personal Development Nerds. And I, when I was doing some market, market research, and I realized that like personal development is actually a niche. It's like a super niche. And it's like less than 1% off, of, off a niche. And so when I saw that, I was like, wait, what? Like you're saying that we're like outliers in this regard of like actually want to reflect and like improve our lives. Like what are other people doing? And if that's like the majority over 90% of the population, what's, what's kind of going on there? For me, I do think that there, I don't think that there was an epiphany moment or like one thing. I think it, think of it as in like you're asleep and someone is trying to shake you awake, but it kind of takes a couple shakes. I think I've gone through life experiences that have been those individual shakes. Unfortunately, uh, it was pain and suffering <laughs> that were for those shakes. And so for me, personal development has always been uh, need based. I think I, even how I frame my community, personal development community or the community that I'm responsible for, uh, we're kind of counter personal development culture. I actually personally don't like personal development culture that much. No, there's a toxic, we, we, we just talked about James's video, right? The toxic version. Yeah, exactly. Of it, yeah. There, are, there are these gurus and whatnot. And I wouldn't kind of, I think there's some good to Tony Robbins, for example. There's definitely, I've learned a lot from Tim Ferriss. Yep. But I think that there's a fundamental difference in their approach. I think Tim Ferriss's approach is very curiosity and like, pr- like deeply rooted in privilege. I think Tony Robbins is not that, I think he's blessed with a physiology of just both his demeanor, his size, he's a little giant and his voice and his ability to just use inspirational and motivational messages to kind of have this, like, I think of him almost as like a motivational drug dealer. And I think he can change life and he has changed lives. His book has influenced millions of people. Um, but I think that there, there's always this kind of with the, the, the niche, God is dead. And with the death of religion, we find things to worship. And I think there's this dynamic where people end up worshiping him. Um, and it, even within the grander culture, people, people are monetized based on their insecurities. And there's these like quick get rich quick schemes or these, this one thing can change your life. Um, if there's one thing that can change your life, then I, I, I think that you're, you're thinking of your life in a very simple, what narrow term, uh, you're, you contain multitudes. You're, you're always constantly changing. So it, it, there, there are always going to be things that challenge you. And for me, I have done uh, like, problem and need based driven personal development and some of the, the the original catalysts were when my dad left the family when we were seven and i had to grow up as a seven-year-old i had to like become the man of the house the little boy as the, of the house and uh that required me to mature to be able to take care of my mother uh, my brother and to be able to start taking care of myself because my mom now would have to try to find second job. She was going to be home all the time. So we had to watch ourselves. That was when I wasn't able to uh, afford to go to high school. So I ended up selling candy to pay my way through high school. And that's another story of its own. That's going to have to be like a part two, because that's like an hour long story. Dude, Uh, dude, we got to get into that for sure. Every entrepreneur has those kind of those kind of stories. So you definitely have the entrepreneurial blood in you. That's yeah. Out of necessity, you said too, right? So it's like these things, yeah. Everything has been out of necessity. 
It's That's crazy. solving one problem after another for myself and for other people and f- becoming a better person so I can bear the burden um, of responsibility and ob- like duty. Uh, I've molded myself into a servant leader. Uh, life is inherently suffering. And to bear that suffering, you kind of have to get stronger. Uh, and so for me, those different callings or opportunities, my own personal gifts, um, but people that I deeply care about and want to help has like driven me to get better. So I have the capacity to help them. Man, that's incredible. So you definitely follow the stoic philosophy behind. Yeah. I'm significantly influenced by uh, stoic philosophy, uh, but also Zen Buddhism as well. So Zen, I actually got introduced to by accident because when I, there was a period in time where we did reconnect with my dad and we stayed with him. He had a friend who was a, a guy that would just like sell stuff on the street. Um, so like one of those corner dealers and he would also bring uh, these VHS uh, tapes of bootleg martial arts uh, videos to, to, for me and my brother to watch. And so one of them, there was this Shaolin monk who was like meditating and kicking ass. And I was like, oh, that's badass. I want to kick ass too. So he was meditating. I was like, oh, I'm going to try to do that. And I didn't, it didn't click to me that that was meditation, but I was, it was kind of this Trojan horse introduction of mindfulness because I wanted to be like these badass Shaolin monks. Uh, and so that's how I got like introduced to meditation. <laughs> that's so cool. It's, it's always the, um, the Trojan horse. Like, Cause I feel like a lot of people are just not into it. You know, they're like, nah, I just have to sit still. Like people find it boring. Like I can't do it. My mind's always racing. Again, it's like the 99.9% of people that just don't even care. Do you need the Trojan horse? That's really, really interesting to me how, how that happened, man. Well, you know what? We, we're definitely gonna have to do uh, a part two because I don't want to keep you on. We could go on forever. Um, We'll definitely get more into the entrepreneurial side of things. I'm sure you have projects and ideas, but before we even get to that, what is just like, you know, one thing that like you're super excited about, you know, it's coming up in the future, whether it's in the technology, in the productivity space, maybe it's just in Zen Buddhism, like just anything. What really excites you that, you know, there's there's huge opportunities that really gets you, you know, excited about the future. I think that's that's how I really like to to end these things off because I think that's where real insight comes. That's where, you know, you get that joy. Like, oh, this is what joy is because I'm actually excited about something. So for you future, I know there's shit going on, but what are you excited about? I think uh, earlier I talked about uh, just how the creative destruction that's happening, this kind of blowing apart of the, the, the foundation of society, the Lego blocks are being placed back on the table for us to reconfigure in new ways and how new tools and technologies are being developed. I uh, talked about like the hedgehog versus the fox. And there are certain tools that have properties within those archetypes. Evernote is very uh, hedgehog oriented. And a new tool run research I'm really excited about is very fox oriented. And there's a new methodology around note taking and better thinking called the Zettelstein method, which was popularized by a book called How to Take Smarter Notes. Um, and then there's another uh, uh, software engineer called Andy, who has created a, a another uh, para like uh, para level methodology called Evergreen Notes. And those are ways how to create atomic units of notes that focus on one concept that within the body of that concept can interlink between other atomic concepts. And so it's a way how to build like Naval level, like paragraphs that are very dense wisdom, but are interconnected. So you can build like this maze of thoughts and this idea is spreading like a virus in, in the knowledge management and productivity space. And I think that there's going to be another creative explosion of just like these next level talented art authors that are able to create much deeper, complex yet simple um, essays and other works of art uh, because they've been empowered by these tools like Run Research or Obsidian um, and these methodologies like the Zettelkasten or the Evergreen Note system. So I'm really, really excited about that. Dude, that is awesome. And what are some resources where people can find out about this stuff? Like, obviously, you're really tapped into it. That's clearly where, like, maybe you form partially part of your bubble. Where do you go to to learn about this stuff? What's new and what's upcoming? Yeah, well, first off, you could definitely follow me on Twitter. Um, Twitter.com slash Giovanni. This is J-U-V-O-N-I or at my website, Giovanni.com. Uh, I definitely live on the frontier. So if you want to find the bleeding edge, I can be like the primary node to that. And you can look through my follower list for some other people who are are close to the edge too in their own domains. And 
it's hard to give like one particular source. Um, I, I like finding just really golden uh, subreddits that are, are very good aggregators or Hacker News, which is another good aggregator. Um, but really using Twitter to find like key people, I think is going to be your fastest way uh, to learning about these tools. And are these people that you follow so that people can just go into your follow following list? Yeah, yeah, you can go into my following list. Uh, to to find out some of these people. And so most of them have been validated. I have a very tight and compact follow list, of like less than 400 people. So uh, it, it it is very high impact. I got to shed mine for sure. <laughs> you just reminded me, I got to shed mine. That's awesome. I, I, I know your Twitter, that's what drew me to as soon as I saw your page. Um, very insightful, lots of wisdom, and it's a lot of great content all packed into one. Like you don't have a lot of fluff, not too many retweets mine has been crap because again mine is just everything everywhere I'm, I'm a massive node into a lot of different things so i'm definitely taking a page from your book and sort of um you know kind of crafting things a little bit better uh, and then what would you say is like an opportunity right now you know there's all these different tools coming out there's you, you know you, you have a pretty good mind on the entire landscape where are the opportunities that still lie um, for maybe entrepreneurs who want to build these tools, maybe something you've been thinking of, where are the opportunities right now? Yeah, I think there's going to be opportunities around communities, supporting the next generation of communities. I think tribe is going to be, become very important in, in these next rough patches that, that we go through in society. So I think tools that support uh, open communities will be very important. I think uh, better tools for education are going to be crucial. Um, I think that more resource, I think the biggest opportunity though, or my own personal hope is that we kind of revisit the physical world and start working on our physical infrastructure and systems, like start focusing on real estate, uh, start focusing on to make more affordable housing, start focusing on medicine, um, that like universal healthcare becomes more of a reality. Uh, start focusing on local governments so that people can be more civil and engaged. So I think the biggest impact opportunities will be co- be found in the real world. Matt, I can't agree more. My biggest thing that I've been really thinking about, are, have you heard of the book, The Future is Faster Than You Think? No. I'm sure you've heard of it. Did you? Did you, you I, haven't. I, I may have heard of it, but I haven't read it. Check it out. Uh, Stephen Kotler and Peter Diamandas. The book is incredible. He's, they've also written the book Bold and Abundance. It's like the third book in that series. Um, out of all these things, all these digital things they're talking about, even like they're talking about, you know, SpaceX and all this stuff. The one thing that really resonated with me that I think is a huge opportunity is like in local food, growing food, like actual fruits and vegetables uh, and, and local distribution. In, in food production. I think that will be huge. And, the, you know, the, the way that you're saying, you know, the physical world, um, everyone needs to eat. And I think giving people healthier food will just like bring us back to that like positive feedback loop rather than feeding people crap food and takeout and stuff. You know, I, I think that will be a huge opportunity personally. I agree. Cool, man. So uh, other than Twitter, where can people find you? Can they, can they join your Facebook group? Is that an open group? Um, where else can people find you? Yeah. Yeah. You can just search for uh, personal development nerds on Facebook. And there's a mini form to apply just a standard Facebook group questions. And you can kind of leave a note where, where you heard about the group so it can be approved faster. Um, and then you can find me on, on Twitter. Like I mentioned, again, I'll reiterate this twitter.com slash Giovanni. Most of my social is actually just my my first first name. Uh, I think I, I'm, I'm kind of aiming to be like the next Oprah slash Naval Ravikant. So uh, yeah, you can find me at most places by my first name. Dude, that is awesome. I'm so glad that you got that because 100%, if you have that one word, just the one name, done. Game over. Male Oprah, dude, you're it. Yeah. So hopefully this is like one of those things we we're talking about earlier, the up and coming. So hopefully we can look back on this and be like, oh shit, like... He he went on the up. Like he man, I can see you definitely going a fucking supernova here. So dude, this is awesome. I hope we can do this again because I definitely want it's even been like almost two hours and it hasn't been long enough. So hopefully we can do this again because this is amazing. Yeah, we definitely were reaching close to Joe Rogan territory. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> just hanging and talking. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed it as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's awesome. Well, Giovanni, thanks so much for coming on here. We'll definitely have to do this again. Yeah, thanks for having me. 